Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 4th of November. Today we're doing a full frontline update starting off with the situation in Kherson. Let's look at what's going on in Krinky. In this area, Russian forces organized squads to launch a counterattack onto Krinky from the forested areas in the south. They were able to send squads in this particular instance that I'm going to show. It was a squad of about 11 men that were able to enter within the roads in the village. But upon doing that, they encountered fire from Ukrainian forces that were within the houses and they were firing small arms fire onto the Russian squad, which caused the Russian squad to begin to retreat back to the forest. As they were doing that, a lot of those Russian forces were killed by the fire and those that survived, they were targeted by the 35th Marine Brigade's drones. And so in that particular instance, the counterattack was repelled. So far, the Ukrainian forces have been able to hold back all of those Russian assaults from the southern direction. There's also reports of attempted Russian attacks from the northeast, and that would be from the village of Korsunka. The unit that is involved in doing that from the reports I've read is the 205th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade, but there's no information about any sort of frontline movement since the reporting on that. And there was also some reports of Ukrainian attacks in the direction of Kozachi Lahari that were repelled. And so that's all in terms of the front line. The Ukrainian forces within Krinky, they continue to be resupplied, not just through speedboats, but also through these drones that are able to lift rather heavy loads. And then they drop the supplies for the Ukrainian garrisons within Krinky. So there's multiple ways of maintaining the bridgehead. Meanwhile, the Russian forces are now shelling the Ukrainians within the houses in Krinky. So just as an example, here we have TOS-1A MLRS fire onto Ukrainian positions within Krinky. Here's a specific geolocation. You could see that by the end, there's at least six different strikes on these houses over here, which does indicate that the Russians are willing to use some heavy firepower in order to combat the Ukrainian forces in this region. And at the same time, the Ukrainians, they have moved in the Project M2 drone unit to the southern bank of the Dnieper River to conduct additional drone operations onto the Russian positions around Kursunka. In this video that I've linked over here, their FEV drones hit Russian fort positions in houses within Kursunka. Now moving on to the Vukhodar sector, the Russians launched an attack on the early morning of November 2nd. There was first a Russian artillery preparation on their Ukraine positions around Vukhodar, and then the Russian armor, which includes tanks, MTLBs, BMPs. It came from this road along Yeharivka to Pavlivka and then into Mikilske. The columns, they made it all the way to the eastern outskirts of Mikilske, and then the plan was most likely to advance through the fields to the north of Mikilske. But they were not able to do this due to being spotted by the Ukrainian forces defending in the region, which includes the Shadow Drone Unit and the 72nd Mechanized Brigade. So they were able to uh, spot the Russian vehicles before they were even able to enter the gray zone. They were still in staging points around Mikilske. And at that point, there was Ukrainian response with artillery fire. So there was a pretty significant uh, Ukrainian artillery component within the 72nd Brigade. And they were able to hit in this specific video four BMPs and three T-72s. And then another piece of footage I have on the map, there was an additional T-80 BV with a KMT-7 mine plow, which is also hit by the 72nd Brigade, which does indicate that the Russians were preparing to cross over fields, which may have anti-vehicle mines, which again lends credence to the idea that they were going to try to advance to the north through those fields. And due to the use of the MTLBs, it was likely that they wanted to take over some of the tree lines located over here, which could be fortified, and they wanted to dismount infantry. But no infantry was dismounted within these vehicles due to the attacks not even coming into fruition as they were struck before they were able to leave their fort positions within Mikilske. And the full video, if you're interested in it, is located on my map, which I have linked in my description. In total, the Ukrainian sources, they claim that 18 pieces of equipment were damaged or destroyed. There's not full visual evidence for that, but here's another video of a Russian BMP being hit by the 72nd. And in the stats by the Ukrainian side, it includes 8 tank losses and 3 MTLB losses. Now, as I said before, the Russian attempt at attacking over here was likely an attempt to clear the way for infantry to dismount and secure the heights north of Mikilske, which overlook parts of Vuklar and the supply lines leading into the town. So here's Vukhodar for you guys. I'll mark it in blue. And then here you could see one of the key supply lines that leads into Vukhodar. It connects from Konstantinivka from the northeast into Vukhodar. And you could see that currently either 
the heights to the north of Mikilske are, are a gray zone or are under Ukrainian control in this specific region over here. So at the very least, the Russians cannot use it themselves to fire onto Vukhodar and the supply lines. And at worst, these areas can be used by the Ukrainian forces to fire onto the Russian positions that are located on rather low elevation within a river valley within Mikilske. And right now, the Russians have a bridgehead across the local river passing by in this region at Mikilske. So that's their forward position to attack further north, and it is located on rather low elevation. So they do want to try to at least get some additional gains to the north in order to change that situation and to try to fire onto the Ukrainian side in turn and on their positions, which could be located on lower elevation in areas such as this over here in the uh, supply lines that are leading into Vukhodar. Now, Vukhodar is a very important Ukrainian forward defense node for the forces in the Donbass, which gives them a complete domination of the surrounding areas, both on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side, not just due to the elevation of the town, but also due to the height of the massive apartment buildings over here, which range from five to nine stories of just concrete slabs that are also extremely fortified and difficult to clear out or be fired upon. Having control of Vukhodar also allows the Ukrainians to use the fields to the north of it as forward artillery positions to fire onto the Russian logistical lines, including highways and also a rail hub which runs through Volnavaka specifically. Russia's first offensive in this region was launched on the 28th of October in 2022, so just over a year ago. And this started off with the storming of the village of Pavlivka by the 155th Marine Brigade and also by the 36th Motor Rifle Brigade. So those units were involved in the original clearing out of the settlement. And then throughout December, they were able to take most of it besides the agricultural facilities and the areas to the north of the Kashlahach River located over here. And then by the end of January, the Russian forces in this region, once they consolidated their gains in that region, they launched attacks from the southwest, from the south and the southeast. So generally, using these arrows, this, these were the vectors of attack for the Russian forces in this area, but those Russian attacks were eventually repelled. Most of them repelled in the open fields in between Pavlivka and Mikilske and Vukhodar, again, by the 72nd Mechanized Brigade mainly. That was the main fighting force in that region, and it still is. So they have a very experienced artillery component, not just from the Vukhodar sector, but also one that served throughout the Ukrainian counteroffensive around the Velika and Novosilka sector. By the end of February, the Russian assaults on Vukhodar failed completely and the front line stabilized at the Kashlohach River, which runs from Pavlivka over here. And then the Russians had a bit of a bridgehead, which they still have, that I talked about, to the north of Mikilske. And as a result of this battle, the Russian uh, forces, they relieved the commander of the Eastern Military District, Colonel General Rustam Mur Muradov. And this was the individual who was responsible for a lot of the oversight of the battles over here. Now, in the eight months or so since that engagement, the Ukrainian forces have had a lot of time to anticipate the next Russian attack in this region. As we said before, mining the fields in between Mikilske and the strongest Ukrainian positions, which include Vukhodar, as we said before, and this coal mine over here. And then within Vukhodar, again, there's significant preparation with different Ukrainian forces like ATGM crews and snipers that could be utilized within the massive concrete slabs, many of which are still standing and have not suffered uh, that significant of damage despite the very heavy Russian strikes by air and just by shelling on the town itself. And the Ukrainians, they've definitely improved their reconnaissance in the region, and that's why they were able to spot the Russian forces before they were able to advance further north. Due to the fierce resistance by the Ukrainian forces in Vukhodar earlier this year, the Russians expanded their offensive operations recently to include the village of Novomikhailivka, which is a very important defensive node on the front line, where the Russians started launching attacks on this village, especially from the southern flank about a month ago. And here you could see that I colored the Ukrainian lines in this region to give you guys an idea of why Novomikhailivka is so important. It serves as the forward defense node defending the Ukrainian supply lines over here. Because just looking at the broader Russian objectives, if they were able to have their way and take over Novomikhailivka, that would give them access to the village of Kostyantanivka, which is this road junction. One of the roads leads north to Pobieda, another one leads further south to Vukhodar, and this is one of the most important lines that continues to supply the Ukrainian forces in Vukhodar and the surrounding regions. But even if you don't use that road and you go further north, all the way to Uspenivka, 
There is another branch in that road that leads further south to Boho Yavlenka. And then from there, there's a local road that leads into Vukhodar. So Kostantinivka connects all of that system. And from Boho Yavlenka, there's another road that goes through Novo Ukrainka and then reaches this highway over here. But this highway cannot be used to supply Vukhodar anymore because it runs through Pavlivka and Pavlivka is under Russian control. So in earnest, there are two main lines that are being used by the Ukrainian forces. You have this one over here. I'm going to mark it again in yellow for you guys. And then this one over here. And of course, you could use the open fields. The Ukrainians have definitely been doing that. And it is still possible even during the muddy season, but it's just more difficult. And there's uh, it takes a longer time. Some get bogged down. So you do want to have those two roads as your backups. And that's why the Ukrainians have put in a lot of resources into defending Novomikhailivka to prevent the dominoes from falling and allowing Russia to get closer to degrading the Vukhodar supply lines. And that's why you have elements of the Shadow Drone Group and also battalions from the 79th Air Assault Brigade that have been defending in this area for over a year now. Looking deeper into Novomikhailivka, the Russians in this area, they launched their most significant attacks at the beginning of the month of October. But even now, over the past couple of days, about a week ago, they started launching additional attacks in this direction. One of them was recorded on the 26th of October around here. Basically, in the area to the southeast of Novomikhailivka, you had a very small amount of Russian armor that was advancing along this specific tree line. And just due to the small amount of vehicles utilized, it would either have been an attempt at making very marginal gains, like overrunning a specific tree line, or just to reach the outskirts of Novomikhailivka to fire onto the Ukrainian trench positions. Because the Ukrainians do have some extremely fortified defensive positions south of Novomikhailivka, which explains a lot of why the Russians have been unable to break through on the southern sector yet. So just to give you guys a rundown of the Ukrainian defenses over here, there are Ukrainian defensive positions located over here, the southernmost positions. There's Ukrainian positions running all along these two uh, parallel bush lines. There's Ukrainian defenses around this agricultural area. And then there's also very significant Ukrainian defenses that are adjacent to these two parallel, uh, parallel bush lines that have been targeted extensively by the Russian forces. And if you look at Novomikhailivka itself, it's not fortified in the sense of trenches. Like here, there's a video of this Ukrainian soldier who's walking through the southern road of Novomikhailivka. You don't see that many soldiers, by the way, and you don't see that many defenses built up over here. But of course, the houses themselves, they are good for cover, concealment, and just for organizing forces. But if you look a bit further south, there are some very significant trenches that were built up over the course of many months now. On around October 30th, there was another Russian attack, and this one occurred along the road starting in Solotke, going further north, most likely with the goal of dislodging the Ukraine forward positions located over here. And so what happened was you had a column of two MTLBs and two tanks, and they were able to reach all the way to this specific position before they were spotted by the Shadow Drone units, and then they were targeted by Ukrainian defensive artillery, and they were able to destroy one MTLB. At that point, the crew was able to get out. So I believe they, oh, they all survived that. And then an additional MTLB was abandoned in the infantry. They began retreating further south on this road back towards Solotke. The two tanks, they left, uh, they veered to the left, basically, and made it along these two different bush lines. And they were advancing through the open fields until this specific location. And at that point, they fired onto the Ukrainian positions, most likely located over here in this facility. And one of those tanks, it actually had a mine plow, which, which again shows you another layer of Ukrainian defense in this region. That a lot of landmines set up, which targeted a lot of the Russian armor at the beginning of the assaults. And the Russians are now, as a result, having to take those precautions. And once they fired onto the Ukrainian positions, they returned back to the road and then the video cuts out. But most likely, they either fired onto the Ukrainian positions or just returned back to their original spots. Meanwhile, looking at the center of Novomikhailivka, the Russian forces over here, they've uh, launched very heavy artillery bombardment and also very heavy aerial bombardment of the Ukrainian positions over here using the Fab 500 and Fab 1500 aerial bombs, which have the UMPK glide and guidance kits. Meanwhile, looking at the Avdivka front, I have not updated the map yet on the southern flank because there's no geolocations of this, but there was a claim by Rybar that the Russian forces were able to advance by a full tree line, and that tree line was over here. 
So it's about an advance of 800 meters. And the new line, according to the right bar map, is located along here. So you could see that it, if this were to be the case, it would be pretty close to Tonenke and Severine. And at the same time, there was a video released by the Russian side showing their pretty heavy bombardment with two fab bombs onto the supply lines that are leading uh, from Tonenke further south towards the Ukrainian front line. So this is very important uh, road for resupply and potentially for evacuations. So here you can see that strike with the fab with the UMPK. You can see that there are two strikes onto the village over here. Again, I haven't updated the map over here, but there is another claim by Rybar that the Russian forces were able to capitalize on their earlier gains around this quarry and continue advancing with their infantry to the northeast with their new front line looking more like this, according to them. And this indicates that the Russian forces were able to gain a foothold within a key trench line that the Ukrainians are holding. They hold this trench line over here, which is adjacent to one of the uh, supply lines that's leading into the southern part of Avdivka. And this would put them pretty close to the Chimik uh, micro district in southwestern Avdivka, which is one of Ukraine's forward defensive nodes in the region and which has a supply line that we just talked about. Something pretty interesting that I saw on War Gonzo was this video they released showing Russian sappers that they built this tunnel. And this tunnel it started in Russian positions, but it actually made its way all the way into the Ukrainian lines. And you could see the specific geolocation on the map. So you could see some of the, the trenches that were built on the Russian side, but eventually they turned into tunnels. So I'm going to skip a little so you could see those tunnels for a second. Those tunnels, the objective of them wasn't to occupy a new territory, but it was actually a way for the Russian forces to build under the Ukrainian fortified trenches in the region and then place explosives over there. And then the Russian sappers withdrew and they blew up the entire tunnel. And as a result, the uh, intention at least would be to destroy the Ukrainian trenches as well. So here you could see some aerial footage of that. You could see the result of the explosion that was caused by that detonation. And I've never seen anything like this before in the war, so it is pretty interesting. And it does make sense for it to happen around here because the Ukrainians do have some very significant trench systems built up in the southern part of Avdivka. Even on Google Maps, you could see it over here, it's running like this. So we'll have to see if the Russians, they begin adopting this more broadly as they try to overrun and uh, fire onto the Ukrainian positions located over here. Another claim made in Rybar's map update is that the Russians were able to advance south of the village of Isale. And the line that they marked generally runs like around here. And I wasn't able to verify all of that, but there is a geolocation over here from Ukraine's 116th Territorial Defense Brigade. And it shows their FPV drone hitting a Russian position in a spillover tunnel, which it basically carries the water from the dam. So you could see that it's located over here, which would indicate a minor Russian advance. And it would also indicate that the Russians are using that spillover as a tunnel to hide from the Ukrainian artillery fire in the region. In the area just to the west of Krasnohorovka, the maps by Deep State and Rybar are actually pretty similar with the dividing line being the rail line. Rybar claims that the rail line itself is now under full Russian control. At the very least, we know that the Russians are now solidifying control over what they did take to the east of the rail line. And something very interesting that I saw on November 2nd by this uh, Ukrainian reporter, uh, Yuri Butusov. He said that the Russian forces were able to cross the rail line on that day and were able to attack in the direction of Stepove. Now again, crossing the rail line uh, itself wouldn't be that difficult if you are just right next to it. Now the question is whether they are able to establish permanent positions. And since November 2nd, I haven't seen enough evidence of that. But either way, it does show that the Russians do have the capability of crossing over now and at least firing onto the Ukrainian positions at close range with Instepove. Something that really surprised me from Yuri Batusov's report is that he claimed that in the months leading up to the attacks on Avdivka, that the Ukrainian forces had not built up rear defensive lines on the northern flank specifically, which is something that I would have anticipated them to do. But according to him, only now they're beginning to dig in and build trenches up in this specific region. But nonetheless, he says that the 110th Mechanized Brigade has been repelling most of the Russian assaults on the northern and southern flanks, respectively. And then in the area just to the northwest of Krasnohorovka, there are further reports of Russian attacks in this direction, generally trying to reach the two different rail lines. You have this rail line over here on Mark and Yellow, which the Russians already reached in one area. And then you have this uh, one that's basically branched out at Orechitnye. 
And both of them are extremely important at this region where you see the three Russian arrows pointing because they're all located on rather high elevation and they serve as a forward Ukrainian defense line. So according to Deep State, the Russians already have a foothold past the rail line, the northernmost rail line located over here. This is where they have the claim for that foothold. And there's a good chance they're correct, so I might have to change the map. I definitely will if there's any visual evidence of that. And this area, basically all the area that's adjacent to the northern rail line is extremely important because not just is it a defense line, but it's also located on rather high elevation in comparison to cross the Horovka. So by taking it, the Russians wouldn't be able to uh, neuter the Ukrainian uh, high ground advantage, with, which they previously had. And it could serve as a forward operating base to attack the Ukrainian forces in Novo Kalinove, which is extremely important for the Russian side because this area, uh, Keramik and Novo Kalinove, is an area that's being used by the Ukrainians to organize forces and then f go further south and harass the Russian columns and Russian infantry that's gathering around Krasnohorovka. So I do believe at the moment it is a top priority for the Russians to find a way to neuter the Ukrainian defense in this region. And lastly, looking at Orikova Vasilivka, here we have a video which is from Sever Z Brigade and the 200th Arctic Motor Rifle Brigade where they shell a Ukrainian dugout just located to the east of Orikova Vasilivka, which prompts the Ukrainian forces in the region to retreat along this road over here back into their houses that are located in Orikova Vasilivka. Part of Orikova Vasilivka in the southern part is a gray zone, but for the most part it is under Ukrainian control. The houses were shelled by the 200th Brigade, and then there was an additional video of the Ukrainian forces walking along the main road of the village and then being hit by the Russian artillery. And then on the other side, a bit further to the north, we have this video from the Ukrainian side uh, showing their mortars hitting Russian positions located just to the south of the E-40 highway, which does prove that there was a minor Russian advance in this specific area over here. And lastly, because we talked in earlier videos about Russia dismissing the commander of the Dnieper group of forces on the Kherson front and replacing them with Teplinsky, it's only fair that we also cover the command reshuffling that's occurring right now on the Ukrainian side. So a news that came out, I believe it was yesterday, November 3rd, was that Major General Viktor Korenko, he's the commander of Ukraine's Special Operations Forces since July of 2022, he was dismissed and replaced by Colonel Surhi. Lapanchuk, and this was due to Zelensky firing him at the request of Defense Minister Rustem Umuryov. And this comes, as Zelensky said on the 3rd of November again, in one of his uh, daily speeches, that he has uh, ordered the shuffle of Ukraine's command structure, which could indicate that there is a shift in Ukrainian focus over the next couple of months on uh, the military side of things, as we see a shift away from Ukraine's focus on the southern counteroffensive on Donetsk and the Zaporozhye Oblast in favor of smaller but still uh, significant attacks, uh, mainly raids now, but trying to create bridgeheads, especially across the southern bank of the Dnieper River on the Kherson front. That's the one area where the Ukrainians do still have the initiative to a significant extent, while on most other parts of the front line, especially around Evdivka, uh, Bakhmut fronts, not as much, but oh, especially on the Kupiansk front, the Ukrainians trying to prepare for a long defensive battle. So that could be some of the rationale behind uh, Zelensky now going out of his way to reshuffle the command structure. So they have that sort of mindset when they're thinking about the situation on the front line. And of course, there's always the political factor. I don't exactly know what the uh, political differences are between those different forces, but that could definitely be at play. And lastly, looking at the Ukrainian command structure again, on November 3rd, Ukraine's 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, they had this artil uh, artillery awards ceremony. And within the crowd, you had over 100 people. This ceremony was held in Zaporozhye Oblast, which raises a lot of red flags that such an event with so many people, especially people that were going to receive awards. So these are experienced artillerymen, many of them officers, commanders of platoons within the 128th, Mountain Assault Brigade and their artillery wing, they were all being awarded at the same time in the same place, such a dense area. They were struck by a Russian KH-59 cruise missile, which killed at least 20, but I saw reports of 22 to 25, and then you had at least dozens of Ukrainian uh, forces that were wounded in the strike, so you had many highly experienced artillerymen. As I said before, there were artillery platoon commanders that were targeted as well, that were killed. 
And that again shows the dangers of congregating a large force in an area that is close to the front line. Even if it was held on the border of the um, Zaporozhye Oblast, it doesn't really matter either way. It is still way too close to the front line and could be spotted by the Russian reconnaissance in the area. And it does also lead to a certain extent further credence to the sentiment by Zelensky and a lot of Ukrainians, uh, especially the Ukrainians in the presidential office, that the command changes in the Ukrainian armed forces are needed. And so that's all I have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.